Hey everyone, this is Oscar from Underdog, and today I want to see what we can learn from a reconstruction from Adana Twins C3PO. We're going to have a look at the process behind recreating this track. Have a listen. So this is my recreation of the track, this is not the original, because playing the original on YouTube can get you into some trouble. So what instead I did was I tried to approximate it as closely as possible, and in the process of doing that, I drew a couple of conclusions and lessons from this production that I want to share with you today. Before we go any further, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and consider signing up for one of our classes on underdog.brussels, we're an online music school, not just a YouTube channel. Now let's jump straight into it. Rule number one, you can't fix a bad kick. So during the process of creating this, I had put a kick sample on my timeline and started working with it, started creating things around the kick. And then when I A-B tested with the reference track, I kept feeling like my kick was small, was not bright enough, it was too dark, it had too much of the sub-frequencies rather than the mid-frequencies. And I tried equalizing it, and then I started saturating it. And at that point, I started to realize that, you know what, I should just have the courage to go out and find myself a kick that actually suits the track, that has the same punchy character as the original. It took me five minutes, 10 minutes to find the right kick. I had to audition a lot of different kicks, but I have some good sample packs for that. And after a while, suddenly I found a kick that out of the box matched. It had the same punchy low end, but also the same tough middle and crisp high as the reference track. And suddenly my job became a million times easier. All I had to do was just equalize a little bit to make it fit into the rest of the track. And I didn't have to worry about what my kick was doing. So in dance music, try not to take a soft kick and then try hard to make it a hard kick. It is possible, but it takes experience and there's so much that you can do wrong. It's way easier for your own workflow to start from a kick that is very close to the final timbre that you want, that only needs a little bit of equalization. If you find yourself compressing your kicks super heavily, layering your kicks super heavily, anything like this, ask yourself if it's really what you want to be doing. That is of course fine if you enjoy the sound design of kicks, but if you just want to get to a finished track, find yourself a sample that's close to the end result and just call it a day. Your future self will thank you. Now lesson number two, Morse code signals are everywhere. I don't know if you watched the recent video on what we can learn from Tale of Us, but there I identified a type of synthesizer that's always just playing the same note, but it's a rhythmical pattern. And that rhythmical pattern, it gives context to both the groove and to the harmony of the song. Well, in this song, Again, we have the same thing. We have the main riff, but then also this. Let me loop that. And so all that is, is one note over and over again in a pumping 16 note pattern. Let me show you that. So it goes from low to middle to high to middle. So it just goes do 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 but always the same note. It also has some delay on it and some reverb on it. So this Morse code is kind of a secret weapon. It's something subtle that even a lot of people won't pick up on, but it does give your production more dimension and more character and a stronger harmonic basis. Now the third lesson is that on brassy sounds, the attack of the filter is crucial. Let's talk a little bit about this lead sound. This is the lead sound. First, let's talk for a second about the notes programmed. So what we've got is, this track is in C minor, by the way. So what we've got here is we've got some notes on the syncopated beats, so the weak beats, up here playing the flattened seventh. Now the flattened seventh and the flattened six are two characteristic notes of the minor scale. So the bass, that's a spoiler alert for later, but the bass is playing a C, and in C minor, these notes exist. In C major, these notes don't exist. So by the fact that these notes exist in combination with a bass that's playing the C, we know immediately that we're in a minor key. So that creates the atmosphere of this song already very clearly. So we go from these signature notes down to this signature note, and then we go to the root and the fifth. 
So we've got this descending. Na, na, na. That's a pattern and then interspersed with this. And as you'll notice again, it's on the weak beat, weak beat, weak, weak beat, weak beat, weak beat. And this is the upbeat. And so there's only one, two strong beats in there. So this is really syncopated. It's really syncopated and it gives a real groove. So together with a very straight kick, it feels like it's kind of swirling around you because it's almost never playing on the kick, which would be a too simple rhythm. It's a syncopated rhythm. Here, with the kick, let's listen to it. Now for the entire track, they don't change this pattern. This pattern stays stable the entire time. But to come back to our lesson, let's talk about the sound design of it. So what we've got is we've got ourselves a wave table with two oscillators that are very similar to each other, almost identical, and they're slightly detuned compared to one another. So one is detuned 17 semitones up, the other one's detuned 16 semitones down, which creates kind of that feeling of two sawtooth waves that are slightly detuned, but I've also panned one slightly left, panned one slightly right, and then used some of the modern wave folding techniques here to give the sound a little bit more bite. If you think about it, all I'm doing is I'm making the oscillators a little bit richer, a little bit brighter, a little bit more biting, but at the end of the day, it's just the same as two sawtooth waves going into a low pass filter like any subtractive synthesizer could do. That low pass filter then has an envelope applied to it, which is envelope number two here, that has a shape that has a little bit of attack to it. So let me show you what happens when I put that attack to zero to make it a real pluck sound. And when I make that attack a little bit too long to make it a very fade in sound, you'll see the subtlety of what, how a few milliseconds really make a difference, okay? So the shortest is like this. See that fade in? That would be more characteristic of a brass sound. And now we've gone too far. So anywhere between, I don't know, maybe 10 and 100 milliseconds, we get a, that kind of a slide up on the filter that's characteristic of anything that you might call a trumpet, horn, brass sound. And there's many different shades in between that. So there's, it feels more lazy or more snappy de depending on if you make it shorter or longer. So this is one of those parameters that's very much worth mapping to a macro by right clicking on it. And it'll then appear up here on the left. And you can call this the filter attack, give it a nice color. And then instead of having it go from zero to several seconds, you hit map and you choose the range that you want it to exist in. So let's say um, filter attack, we want it to be anywhere between 10 milliseconds at its shortest, and what did I say? 100 milliseconds at its longest, right? So now when we move this button here on the, on the bottom, at the longest, it's gonna be at the longest, and at the shortest, it's gonna be at the shortest, but either way, it's gonna be within the range of sounds that we're gonna consider our sweet spot for this synthesizer. So. Let's check this out. That's very cool. We can use this in the track to shape our sound. And then the other one that I've already mapped is the filter cutoff. So let's call it the filter cutoff because that's always a satisfying parameter to tweak. So these two together. So this gives us a lot of tools that we need to create these splashes of energy in the song and then take it away. And so we can tease this element for a long time and then in the climax, bring it in. And that way we don't have to change the note pattern at all to keep things interesting. We can just change the timbre of the sound, which is determined by these two parameters. To make this a bit more complete, let me show you also the signal chain a little bit further. So the effects that I used. So what did I do? I put some saturator on there because I just wanted this thing to be a little bit more bright. It is the lead element after all. It is supposed to be like the star of the show. So I saturated a little bit. Then I put a limiter on there. So what I did was I found the right volume that I liked it to be at in the track for the mix down. And that way when I open up the filter, 
it actually goes louder and so it goes into this limiter and it stays more or less at the same volume as it was before. You could probably do this with a compressor in a more tasteful way, but a limiter is kind of the brute force way of doing this. So that means that no matter how open the filter is or how close the filter is, it's always going to sit more or less at the same place in my mix down. Then after that, I've added a delay, which is a 16 note ping pong delay with quite a lot of feedback and dry wet. So it spreads that sound into the stereo field even more. And then I've put a reverb on there, which is a parallel reverb. So what it is, is there's a dry channel, right? So the dry channel uh, just lets the sound through unobstructed. And then on the reverb channel, I put on a really, really, really big reverb. And I cut away all the mud in the lows because this is the reverb. Imagine if I don't cut away the mud. Let me show you here. See all of this? That's not desirable. First of all, we're adding ridiculous rumble to our stuff, but also the low mids are being clogged up. So let's just carve out the low mids in our reverb and give our mix down a bit more room to breathe. After all, the low mid frequencies are really prime, prime, prime real estate in your track. You don't want too many elements contributing to your low mid frequencies that don't belong there. So, so be very intentional about which elements you give some space in the low mids. Then at the climax of the track, I noticed that this element actually has some bit crushing on it. And so I've put Ableton's Redux plugin on there, which can give you something like this. During the climax, I thought that would be kind of cute. And then at the end, I've just put a shaping plugin just as a mix down tool, which is an EQ that just slightly tilts the sound towards the high end because I found that I needed to de-emphasize a little bit the low mids and emphasize a bit the highs. So do you see a little bit my logic there? First, I've got the source sound, then a few very obviously creative effects. And the further I go down the signal chain, the more and more it is about fitting this element into the context of a track. I also build in at the very start some controls that allow me to change the energy level of this sound. Okay, now key lesson number four is layer some white noise in with your synthesizers as your climaxes are arriving. There's a particular bass synthesizer that they use throughout the track that's very subtle, but then at a certain moment, the filters open up and a whole bunch of white noise is layered in with it. So it goes a little bit like this. And as you open it up, So not only does the filter open up over the sawtooth waves that are playing, so it's like a kind of a typical Marauder kind of 16 notes bass line, but at the same time, there's also a noise oscillator in there that's creating all these white noise splashes, the same way that you would do with a cymbal or some other kind of transition effect. On most subtractive synthesizers, you have a couple of oscillators and a noise oscillator, and you can just choose to add in that noise oscillator. Now, I don't believe that Ableton's wavetable actually has that as an option. So I already used two of the oscillators to create the bass sound. So what I did was I simply made an instrument group and that instrument group I duplicated once and then turn the oscillators into white noise. So then you've got the actual bass plus the white noise layer, and all of that is mapped to the macro, which I called the opener. And the opener, what it does is, it just raises the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter that's shaping this sound. And most of the time, the sound is fairly under control and not taking a lot of attention in the track. But then during the break or the climax, you can open it up and then really splash in that energy. Lesson number five is that if you are using Wavetable for your sound, try mapping a macro to the time and the amount in the mod matrix. So the mod matrix has these global controls down here, which allow you to set the time of any time related parameters and the amount of any number related parameters. And what this does is it lengthens your envelopes or shortens your envelopes and it raises the frequency of the filter also. So this is how I mapped this opener. I mapped it to these two parameters. And so what it does is it exaggerates how high the envelope goes to open up the filter and it exaggerates how long the envelope takes to go over that filter. So it generally creates this big swelling motion. Look, when I move this one on here, you can see the time go up and the amount go up and the time go down and the amount go down. This is a really powerful tool to just make your entire synthesizer go from a smaller version of itself to a more epic version of itself. It's like dialing everything up to 11. 
Then, of course, any synthesizer that has a lot of movement in it, don't be afraid to put it into some really long reverb effects because that smears those movements out over time, over a long time, giving your whole track a lot of movement. Now, the last learning is for you kick tuning nerds out there. I, I feel like tuning your kicks has become a big topic online, sparked somehow due to a, uh, a rant by Dead Mouse. And you have people in favor and not in favor, but everyone's very excited about it. <laughs> well, so let me just describe what Adana Twins did in this track so we can actually learn from evidence. So this track is in C, right? The bass synthesizer is always playing C. The lead melody has something to do with C minor. So let's just assume that our tonal center is C, right? So the low end, these two elements, are always just playing C. And that means, let's have a look at our spectrum analyzer. C is right here at 66 hertz, right? And 33 hertz. So 33 hertz and 66 hertz denote the octave, the lowest octave uh, from C to C, right? Now, if your kick fundamental falls on one of those frequencies, it's going to potentially either amplify the bass too much or cancel out the bass due to phase cancellation. I mean, that is if your kick is long and has a lot of tonal qualities to it. If it's short and punchy, you probably don't have a problem. But Adana Twins sidestepped this issue by having a kick that is on F. So the kick is tuned to F. And let's have a look at what frequency that is. So 43. So we're talking about 33 to 66 hertz. 43. It's the fourth note of the scale. It's almost halfway between the low C and the high C there. It is basically sidestepping this entire issue. The chances of unwanted interference between the C and the F is relatively minor. It's just very conveniently chosen. And by the way, you know what note the kick is, not from any fancy schmancy techniques. You just look at the kick, you open up the spectrum, you bring it up, and you look at where the peak is, right there. So there, do with that information what you want. Tune your kicks, don't tune your kicks. You don't have to, but if you want to, this is a strategy of someone else who has done it and it works pretty well. Now I'll play the track again, but in the meantime, check out one of the other music production videos here. Stay producing, be good to one another, take care, and bye-bye.